Greetings Metalheads, Merry Christmas to you all, I hope you're going to have a great Christmas. First of all I want to thank everybody who's been involved with the Friday 13th YouTube channel. If you've subscribed, thank you. If you haven't, please do. Please tell your friends to as well. So, next year, 2022, I'm going to be into uploading more interviews, a lot of audio ones from 10, 15, 20 years ago and 30 years ago for you to check out. Next year in 2022, there's also going to be a lot of audio visual interviews for you to listen to and watch. So have a listen, have a watch, let me know what you think. So today, I'm going to upload an interview for you, interview for you to listen to with a band called Zero Hour. A band from the US, a progressive metal band who were fantastic. Very technical, a little bit like Watchtower, Fate's Warning, bit of psychotic waltz, Spiral Architect, them type of bands. So this interview was conducted with bass player Trey Tipton many, many years ago. Have a listen. Let me know what you think. Uh, at the end of the interview, I will be uploading a song for you to check out so you can have a listen to see what they sound like if you don't know the band. So, as I said, have a great Christmas. Be safe, folks. Stay metal. Support Friday 13th YouTube channel and the website www.friday13thmetal.co.uk Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Be safe, folks. Have a head-banging Christmas, yeah, and I'll speak to you all soon. Thanks for watching and listening. See ya. Hi, Troy. Hey, how you doing, man? No, man, how are you? Uh, not bad, man. Yeah, it's going crazy get, down here. <laughs> finally, we get to speak to each other at long last. Yeah, man. Yes. So, um, yeah, we, you know, unfortunately, we never got to check out the, um, you know, the first issue I know that you put out on our, you know, with a review of our self-titled. Yeah, kit, right. Man. So how's the rest of the band? Everybody's doing good. Everybody's doing good, getting ready to go to Europe, you know. Some hopefully we'll to them. Hopefully we'll get to play out, you know, um, go back again and play out more places, man. Visit the UK as well. Yeah, Shit. yeah, yeah it'd be nice. Say hello to the rest of the guys for me. I will, man. All right then, Troy. First of all, I'd like to ask you um, a couple of warm questions. My first all question right. is, so when did the band form and who formed the band? Was it you and your brother? Yeah, Jason, myself, and actually Mikey as well. The three of us, we started the band back in 93. Three, yeah, ninety three, and then um, yeah, later on we, uh, you know, we were just writing material and stuff, and we auditioned. Uh, actually, we got another guitar player first, so we were a two guitar band, and then we uh, auditioned singers. We came across a guy, and you know, we started working with him. Things didn't work out. We worked with another guy. Later on, we went to uh, actually uh, Mike Varney's house, out of all people, you know. Oh yeah. And uh, we brought a demo down there, and uh, he was like, you know, you know, why don't you guys get a keyboard player, you know, lose the other guitar player, you know, get a keyboard player. He's all, that's the whole thing that's going on right now, you know, the Dream Theater thing. Yeah, right. And so we kind of, at that point, we kind of fell, you know, a little bit to, you know, the industry. You know, we were kind of naive and stuff, so, you know, we got another keyboard player. Not that, you know, nothing was wrong with that and stuff. But, you know, we changed because of, you know, what someone said. And then I uh, got more into the Dream Theater, uh, you know, more into like that, I guess. And then, you know, shit. Then we ended up uh, doing a demo with our old singer, Frank Mendez. It was called Discovery. Is that the guy who sang, you, you mentioned it was the first singer? Yeah, he was first singer. Yeah. Why did he, he leave? Was, what was his reason? Well, what happened is uh, he was feeling that, you know, he had a family. He had two kids, had a wife. And, um, you know, there was also, at the same time, you know, uh, Pressure. Mike Varney, yeah, Mike Varney didn't really dig his voice too much. Well, what, also, what and then, well, well, the thing was with him is that he had a real monotone voice. He wasn't, he didn't have a whole lot of range. He didn't establish a whole lot of range with the band. And at the same time, he wasn't really dynamic. It was like when the band came in, there was a lot of energy. But then when he started singing, it brought the energy down because he was just pretty much, he didn't like mix it up enough. He wasn't dynamic enough. He didn't get rough when he needed to get rough. And, you know, he's pretty much just the same throughout the whole song, held the same kind of tone and, you know, just not really dynamic. So I can understand the reasons of, you know, why Mike had mentioned something. And then, you know, from the pressures of that, he was like, you know, do you guys still want me in the band? And we're like, uh, well, yeah, man, you know, we want, you know, we still want to work with you and stuff. And then we didn't hear from him for like a week. Right. And we didn't know what to say to him because, you know, this was coming back from Mike Varney's place, you know. So it was like, you know, kind of a big blow to us all and stuff. And then uh, 
he called me up. He's all, hey, man, so have you guys made a decision yet? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's all, well, basically, you know, I want to stay with you guys. You know, I, you know, I would like to be in the band still. But if you guys have any doubts, let me know because then I would leave the band. Um, because, you know, if you guys tell me now, I'm cool with it. But if you tell me, you know, a month or two away from now, you know, after you said, no, let's work together, then I'd be pissed. Yeah, right. And then that's when I said, hey, man, you know, I think you're a great singer and all. But um, I would be lying to you if I said we didn't have any doubts at this time. Are you still friends with him then? Yeah, still friends with him. He's still a really good guy, and, you know, I talk to him, you know, a couple times a year and stuff, you know. Um, um, you know, it's he he's still, uh, I, every time I talk to him, it, he you know, he always goes off like, you know, oh, man, the stuff we did was really cool, was really cool. So, you know, I can definitely see that, you know, he was, you know, upset to, yeah, right. you know, left. Actually, uh, have you got anything that yeah, I could listen to, any, any old material? You know what, I'm... You know, I've had so many people when I've said the Discovery demo and stuff like that, had so many people email me that, you know, about that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to have to try and dig out. I believe I have two songs from the demo lying around somewhere. Yeah, I can, you know, definitely make a, a little list and, and send, like, some CDRs to people. What you want to do is you want to do what Twi Beyond Twilight did. They when they were called Twilight, they released a bunch of demos on CD because people were asking for them. Like, yeah. They decided to release old material but never made it. Yeah. Maybe you should I, consider that yourselves if you got enough material to release. Yeah, the, the thing is, though, is that, uh, um, you know, I, I do truly believe um, Zero Hour is really like the four that's in the band right now. So I pretty much probably... I'd make it for, you know, CDRs for, like, select people, yeah, right. you know, and send it out to them because it's really not something that I'd really want to release because there are even, on on that demo, there was two songs, um, you know, uh, okay, uh, Voice of Reason, trying to think of it, oh, yeah, it was Discovery, and originally Discovery, and that was the lyrics that Frank had wrote for that song. And then also Eyes of Denial was uh, Voyage to Ruin, which was uh, written, you know, lyrically by Frank. And then um, the other songs, though, were songs we never released, you know, different songs altogether. Grains of Sand, um, Jesus, what was the other one? Last Cry, and I'm trying to remember this shit. It's kind of funny. Jaded Eyes. Those were the five songs on the demo. So I have to, and I know I have Jaded Eyes, and I have Discovery lying around. And Discovery was actually with uh, this guy, Mike Connor that we had on keyboards for a little while. And he was the guy who actually told us about Eric. And he said, you know, hey, man, I know of a great singer, man. You know, he was in a band with me called Prodigy. And, you know, he I've wants... Heard of Prodigy. I'm not sure. What's that? I think I've heard the name. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I, you know, I, a long time ago when our CD came out, the self-titled one, there, uh, someone on the Perpetual Motion Board uh, listed that, you know, hey, I'm sell selling a Secular Trend, which or something like that. I guess that was what the band ended up calling themselves later on, you know, um, instead of Prodigy. And they had the demos of those couple songs of theirs on the net somewhere or something like that. And I guess they were selling it, you know, I don't know. I think it was a band from Florida called Prodigy who changed their name to um, Oracle. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I know the thing is now in Mystic Force. I don't know if you know about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I do. How about that? <laughs> you know, it's funny how many people have had the same name, you know, over the years, you know what I mean? It was in a band with, like, you know, like one of my first bands was Masquerade or something like that, or, you oh, know. Oh, Swedish one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know, and, and it's funny how you see those names pop up. And Beggar's Opera was another band I was in. And oh, I, yeah. Uh, what were they was like? A... What were these bands like you were in? Were they... Well, there was, um, at first, like, the band that, um, Masquerade, I mean, that was like a high school band, you know, I mean, we just totally sucked, we didn't even know how to play our instruments, really, kind of, that was the, actually, even middle school. Hey, man, you still do. <laughs> What's that? You still do. Oh, of course, you know, well, you I'm know. Joking, I'm joking, we, we wake, you know, I, I mean, you know, we, you know, we just don't wake as bad as we used to, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've gotten a little better at the waking, uh, you know, um. You know, so there you go. 
it's something you get better on with time. But then uh, after, uh, yeah, no, um, Retrospect was probably the coolest band I was in before this band. Right. Um, and that was, uh, had this killer guitar player um, named Sean Sinekin, um, who was, who's out here. And also on the other guitar was another killer player, which was Nick St. Dennis, and he later on went to play with Propane. Oh, on right, guitar. New York. Yeah, exactly. I met, he those played... guys at, I met those guys at Dynamo a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, I he played on their second release. Right. And then now he's he's the bass player in Systematic, which is really weird. God. Yeah, Systematic's the band that's signed on Lars Ulrich's label, so... Oh, God, the I don't, I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they get a whole lot of airplay out there, but they actually play them pretty decently out so here. So what's this Lars Ulrich so. label? Is it money you made from Napster? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, huh? God, shit, I bet it's a real shitty label that he's, he's, he's got going. Yeah. I can't imagine oh. it being very good. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. So you had a different. You had two guitar players when you first started. Who yeah, was this guy? We, yeah. It was uh, Sean Krutoff, This guy, Sean Krutoff, and he was a really good guitar player. Really good guitar player. And uh, it was, but he had like you know he had a real uh, kind of uh, he had an attitude on him. You know what I mean? Kind of a chip on his shoulder, but it, in a, in a kind of humorous way because he was pretty. Uh, the guy was pretty funny. I mean, we're still really good friends with him, but definitely had an attitude and at the time the attitude was kind of uh you know look you know everybody. wearing a little thin on us and so we're like oh man i don't know if we want to keep this guy any longer so when mike varney said why don't you guys ace this guy and get the um you know get a keyboard player and we were like yeah hell we're open for it you know at the time and stuff so that is what we did and we uh never got a permanent guy and obviously on the self-title we uh we had Matt Guillory play on, you know, three of the tracks. He's the guy who was in that band, uh, Daily's Dilemma or something of the kind. Exactly, yeah. yeah. He was he was in that band. And then also uh, we it's had... It's uh, actually. I bought it for like, like five, about four or five English pounds. It's like $10. It's good. Really? Album. It's pretty good. Right on. Good deal. Yeah, they're, you know, um, Steve and Pat, the bass player and the guitar player, they're great guys, man. They're... Uh, I believe they're working on their new album right now. I I don't know what's going on with them right now. I haven't talked to them in a while. Right. Yeah, and then we had also a keyboard player playing Voice of Reason, which was Phil Bennett, and he actually played on uh, Enchant's Wounded album. He played on, like, half of that album, and then also he plays with Starship out here, so he makes bucks doing that. You mean that. The, band, the, the band Starship from the 80s? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he's, like, constantly, like, you know, playing, like, you know, either, at, you know... Vegas or something like that, you know, fairs or something like that. But he's making good money. He lives in a real nice house in Oakland, so oh, he's shit. doing pretty good for himself, yeah. So you haven't had many lineup changes. I mean, what about your brother, Jason? What bands are he in? Was he... J... Jason... I know his name's spelled different to man. It's J-U-S. Yeah, J-S-U-N. The yeah. reason for that is, well, I, you know, my, my mom was a hippie. Uh, child, you know what I mean, and yeah. uh, and uh, I guess you know they just wanted to give it a different twist, you know what I mean. So they did. They went with the U instead of the O. <laughs> so Weird. there, he, yeah. Okay. Well, you know his middle name is Elvis. Are <laughs> you <We> joking? <laughs> no, I'm so. My dad is the biggest Elvis fan you'll ever meet on this planet. Yeah, I thought my just, uncle was the biggest Elvis fan. No, oh, man, you know, I don't know. My dad would probably rival him, man. It's unreal. I mean, like, right now I'm staring at, uh, I'm at the stairway, and I got three um, Elvis, uh, you know, whatever paintings right here, right, right on the wall here. Right. My pop is a huge Elvis fan. He wanted to name Jason originally. Elvis, but my mom was not going for that. She wasn't <laughs> oh, <Jason. blimey. laughs> <I'm> surprised. <laughs> How about that, huh? So was was any was your brother in any bands um, prior to? Um, he was in a band. Um, actually, he was in uh, Travesty. He played keyboards with in a band called Travesty with me a long time ago, which was an instrumental band in high school. And then after that, um, he didn't do anything. Uh, he was never really fully into keyboards he was never you know and then uh he picked up the guitar and started playing and then uh him and i uh got into a band with this other guitar player called empire 
um, a while back, and then um, from there, um, the other guitar player that was in the band was this total power freak, you know, and all he wanted to do was, uh, he didn't want to go in the direction we, like Mikey, Jason, and I wanted to go into. We wanted to play, you know, more technical stuff, and he was like, no, I don't want to do that, and uh, so we parted ways with him, and uh, that's pretty much it. Jay really doesn't have a whole lot of... uh, Band history, you You've know. You've been around, haven't you, by the sounds of it, Troy? You've been in a few bands. Yeah, I've been in a few bands, you know, retrospect. Beggar's Opera, we were like, you know, we played out here for a while and stuff, made a couple of demos, and then um, retrospect was the coolest one. That was like a, a cross between, mm, uh, I'd say, like, Fate's Warning, Crimson Glory, and then uh, the Can guitar playing, though, was like cacophony, you know what I mean? Can it was like. Anything? What's that? Can you send me some stuff? Can oh, I know? wish. You know, I really wish I had that stuff. That's what they all say. <laughs> you know, I don't have any of that stuff because that was back in 89. That's when the not... good stuff was out, man. Yeah, I mean, and that was really cool. We had this singer that was a total midnight kind of oh, guy. Oh, you're and... you got to try to find some of, some of uh, them uh, in your collection. You know, there was only one guy that I knew that had the tape, and, and like, some of the stuff I was playing, like doubling with the guitar players back then, I was just like, when I heard it, like years afterwards, I was like, really, I really tripped out. I was like, oh my god, look, some of that stuff's pretty scary, you know what I mean? <laughs> because I mean, those guitar players were really, really damn good. And um, yeah, I shit, I the, the drummer was the only guy, and you know that guy and I don't talk to each other. I mean, we fucking hate each other. So if I ever run across him or something like that, and you know things are decent i he maybe might have the tape still i really don't know but besides that i know even our guitar player that that was in the band didn't have a tape wow i know, I know all the bands that i've been nice to play drums i've kept all the tapes that we did nice i've been a death metal band we did a concert with cradle of filth when cradle of filth were a demo band nice so, that's about the biggest f- bit of fame I've had. <laughs> no, nice, hey man, that's pretty cool. So, what kind of style was the um, like? What bands were you? Uh, I was in a you know... band called Doctor Butcher, the original Doctor Butcher. Okay, like... yeah, the one that uh, what's his name? Chris? Uh, wait, John Oliva. No, like... I was ta- I was just interviewing Chris from Sabotage, and I told him that I was in a band called Doctor Butcher before then. We were, really? We were like '88. We was playing hardcore music. <laughs> and, uh, like the original Doctor Butch. I've got to send it to Chris and see what he thinks of it. But N- nice. You know, we only did like rehearsal tapes, but I was oh. in a band called Chapel Arrest, like death metal. Um, I joined a band called Malediction that were like Morbid Angel. Malediction. Uh, that sounds kind yeah, of yeah. They've got a couple of they've got a couple of singles out on a CD, I think. Right on. And, uh, man. and then last year I was at college studying music, and I did a, a project just me and my friend. I played rhythm guitar and drums. My friend did bass and lead. Did a project called Power Lord, and the song was called Metal Warriors. It was just like nice. total 80s power metal. <laughs> it's cool, man. I have to copy it for you and see what you think. There's no singing. Yeah, no doubt, man. I, mean, I tried singing on it, but I get the Rob Halford scream, but I couldn't do the rest. I just could no. not fucking do it. <laughs> I just felt to bits. So it ended up being an instrumental. It, it kicks, man, for two people. It's really got some, you know. Nice, yeah. No, I dig to hear it, man. That would be cool. I'll have to send you it sometime. Okay, next question is, uh, Troy, where did you call the band Zero Hour? Did you have any other names in mind? Um, well, what happened is Jay and I were, uh, well, Zero Hour was something, uh, well, okay. Jay and I were, like, writing material one day. We are just kind of, you know, writing material. And then Jay goes, uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we can, you know, just not, you know, have to go to work, because, like, we just got, you know, we were writing and stuff, and then we both had to go to work. We both worked at a comic shop back in the day then. Nice. And then uh, um, I'm like, yeah, you know, that that would kick ass and stuff. He's like, you know, and, you know, where we can, you know, you know, just concentrate on our dream and stuff like that. And I go, zero hour, man. And he's all, what? I'm all zero hour. That's, you know, you know, we're, you know, there's no no such thing as, you know, time you know basically you can just you know put all your efforts you know and not worry about all the distractions out there and just you know you know put everything towards your you know our music our dream and stuff like that and then you know it kind of fit and we just you know used that for the band name when it later came up i always liked the sound of it and i was like hey how about zero hour guys and they were like yeah that's cool so that's really how that one kind of came up Excellent. It's like some friends of mine from Canada called Idol. I don't know if you know the name. No. They're, uh, I, I don't, 
I you said they did an album called Zero. Did okay, they? no, no, I yeah, no, I have heard the band, heard their name. I haven't heard the band though. I know yeah. which one you're talking Glenn's about. Glenn's in King. Da- wait, Glenn used to be in King Diamond. Okay, yeah, yeah. They're a good band when they're looking for a new singer. They just left the, the singers just left because he didn't have a powerful enough voice. They wanted somebody more like a Halford, more aggressive. Ah, I gotcha. So, Right, so I mean, between you and your brother, was there a lot of fist? Is there a lot of fist fights between you? Or <laughs> do you get along really well being in the same band? Yeah, we get. You know, we get along great. I mean, you know, you know, we've pretty much in the past we've worked, lived. You know, you know, playing a band together. I mean, we do everything together. I mean, kind of like a fuck together, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, I mean, there might have been some times like where we had girls in the in the same room with us and stuff like that, and then kind of you know did that or you know what I mean, but never did any switchovers or anything like that, and never, 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 never got close to him or anything <laughs> like that. Fuck that. <laughs> fuck oh, that. But uh, yeah, no. I mean, what's great about it is that we're able to be brutally honest with each other because we write the music in the band so we're constantly you know like i'll be like you know he'll play something i'll go that sucks dude you know go like this well what do you have and i'll play it and something and he'll say hey, well that sucks you know what i mean and we go back and forth and then once we come up with something that we both approve of we know we got the right part and stuff and, and even if there's nights where we leave and we're like just so frustrated not coming up with anything you know, as soon as we get in the car, we're like, hey, man, have you heard the new Meshuggah album? Yeah, pop it on. You know, it's like everything's, you know, just left there at the studio. We don't bring it home no, with no, us. I don't like Meshuggah. You don't like Meshuggah? I think the shit. I think the oh, I love Meshuggah, yeah, man. It's like the same riff on every fucking song. It's just oh, like... no, man, I love those guys, man. Just loaded with polyrhythms, and, oh, man, those guys are fucking great. And Jens is fucking a master at that fucking type of singing, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that stuff, man. So who's the oldest out of you and your brother, then? What's that? Who's the oldest from out of you and your brother? Jay is eight minutes older than me. Right. Well, he d- stepped well, on my face on the way out, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sad to say, man. So I kicked in there a little longer, you know what I mean? Oh, shit. Okay, then, Troy, your next question is, um, who are the band's influences, and how do they reflect in your music? Um, definitely, it's... It, 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 you know, as a musician, your, your influence has always changed. During the first album, um, we were definitely, uh, when we started writing stuff, we were definitely, you know, Dream Theaters, the Images and Words, we were really, you know, digging on that. And right. Parallels, you know, by Fate's Warning or whatever. Yeah, fucking great band. Fate. Yeah, and Crimson Glory, you know, that's the, you know, we were really into a lot of those and stuff. And then it was, Towards the end of that album, we were starting to get into different bands, like, you know, Meshuggah and stuff like that. But um, for me, definitely on this album, and definitely on this album, uh, Towers of Avarice, I think the influences for me, anyhow, were definitely Meshuggah, Atheist, Cynic, Watchtower. Those ones really came out, pouring out for me. And then uh, Jason, same thing. He, you know, Meshuggah, he's big into Meshuggah, but then Jason also was you know, getting huge, hugely into jazz, you know. We're, we're both big Pat Metheny fans and stuff, have been for a long time, and he really started getting in there and exploring that side, you know, listening to players, you know, more than just Pat Metheny. He was listening to Russell Malone and Mark Whitfield, all these great players and stuff. So um, I think just, you know, and we write everything kind of like as if it were a, so- a soundtrack, you know, this songs just kind of go and stuff we really don't format anything it's just whatever happens and just makes it make it dynamic you know make it you know real dynamic and heavy and intricate and dark you know atmospheric so um you know definitely as the albums change and stuff i think we get into newer people and you know our influences change each album i would say right you have been compared to the the likes of circles at walls have you heard them do you agree of uh, which one? Psychotic Waltz. Uh, no, I... Ha- oh, Psychotic Waltz. Yeah, the pro- okay. pro- best progressive band ever. Yeah, you before. know what? I have... I, I heard... I heard a couple of their albums before. I heard one that was like, I guess, their real early album. Was and that one Grace? I couldn't... What's that? Was it a Social Grace? It might have been. I, I, You know, a buddy of mine brought him in. And um, the one when I first heard that one... I couldn't really get into it, Same but then me. when I heard 
the last album, I guess, the, the one just before they broke up, Bleeding. he played me that at a later time. That one was really good. Yeah. That one was really good, and I have I still have not picked that one up. I, I, I need to pick that one up and check it out again. I've only heard it, you know, once. I heard parts of it, you know, some songs off of it, and I thought those were really good. Well, my so. two favorite progressive bands are Fates Warning and Psychotic Walls. Yeah, I, I, I mean... I went on tour with them around Europe for a couple of dates, but... No they kidding. They were awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, when did they break up? It was a while back they broke well, up, three, right? Three years ago, four years ago. Yeah, Jesus. Because I know, you know? the drummer, drum Norm, I keep in touch with him occasionally. He's got a new band called T-Bag. Oh, really? <laughs> are, are they are they progressive and everything? Yeah, it's strange. It's the guitarist of Psychotic Walls, Steve, I think his name was, who did the touring with him. Oh, nice. But, um, I think Have they ever said anything about a possible reunion? I mean, Man, if I ever win the National Lottery in the UK, I'm starting my own record company and they're the first band I'm going to re-sign. Oh, nice! <laughs> yeah, I would, man, definitely. <laughs> nice. like, I mean, it's like, it's like when I first heard Psycho, it was, I thought the music sucked. Yeah. It was so hard to get into, but they ended up being one of my favourite bands. Right on. You know, it's, it's very weird how progressive music is, is because um, a lot of these bands, you know, they get their due later on like after they broke up a lot of these bands like watchtower you know they really when they were out and I stuff saw them laugh. yeah amazing band huh yeah. jesus christ i mean doug kaiser what an amazing bass player oh, i know him i used to write to him <laughs> what's that i used to write to doug uh, oh did you yeah no way yeah i saw them in england once they were great because i know alan who's in hades ah that's right yep yeah I that's know, right i saw them at wacken festival last year Oh shit, yeah, they were man. Cool, man. But yeah, there were some really good bands around, I mean. Yeah, and they never get, a lot of them don't get their due till like, you know, after they've broke up. I mean, I, I, I would probably, from what I've known of Psychotic Waltz, it seems like a lot of the talk has been talked about after, you know, they broke up. They'll, they'll then, always be remembered because they're, they're a band above. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think they're way, way better than Dream Theater. <laughs> I mean, I like Dream Theater, but Dream Theater would just like so much like rushing, yes. So I could have lost, just didn't sound like anyone. Yeah, see, in, in Dream Theater, like, when they came out um, with, uh, when Dream and Day Unite, you know, obviously their singer... Album, that was a good album. Yeah, it was a great album. Their singer wasn't the best, but the melody lines were really good and everything, and then when Images and Words came out, that was a, just a terrific album. But then, uh, for me, anyhow, after that, I just never... All their albums after that really never hit me like, you know, either one of those two. You know what I mean? If for you know, for whatever reason. Um, but uh, yeah, they they kind of uh, lost my interest, you know, as far as their albums that they had done afterwards. So again, Great band, not plenty, tons of talent and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. You know, but um, you know, I I you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's kind of funny. Even though like I listen to a lot of jazz and I listen to you know all kinds of different kind of stuff, um, but there's still a lot of metal in me. And Jay always says that, too. Is like, you know, there's a lot of metal bands. You know, I, I love the crunch. It's got to be there, you know what I mean? I just, yeah. you know, and I love the atmosphere and the, you know, just the darkness of metal. It's really cool, man. Right, so getting back to that question, your influences, do they reflect in the band's music? Yeah, I would definitely say so. I mean, you know, whatever you're listening to at the time and whatever's, you know, you're really digging on i mean yeah of course you don't like you know copy them or anything like that you don't go oh i'm gonna write him a sugar song or i'm gonna write you know an atheist song or something like that but you know it definitely i think pours out you know of your soul you know what i mean and then same with uh at the time when we were writing towers we were really just getting the dick dance from you know all these record labels they were just putting us through this big dick dance constantly you know like okay, yeah, we're going to send you a contract. They sent us a contract, and whatever we verbally discussed and agreed on, they would never make the changes in the written contract when it was sent. You know what I mean? It was just, you know, um, they, they were just constantly, you know, just trying to break you down. You know, one company sent us three contracts, and it was just basically saying, you know, hey, are you tired yet? Are you going to sign this finally? It was just, you know, they just want to mentally drain you to where you're like, fuck it, I'm going to sign it, yeah, you know right. what I mean? But luckily, you know, we, Jay and I, you know, when one was weak, the other one was able to keep the other one strong, and we have a great manager, Ron Sanso, and he was, uh, 
he was constantly telling us, you know, hey man, you guys are worth more than this. Don't do that. That's you know, that would be a stupid move on your guys' part and stuff. And um, you know, so and and we stayed true to ourselves, especially on this album, because uh, actually, what's kind of funny is when you look at the self-titled disc, we originally had a different cover and a different um, photographs for that album and stuff. And it wasn't until we shopped the CD to uh, um, actually Lim Schnorr, and he he got our CD. Oh, but he didn't, yeah, he he didn't, of sounds, yeah, yeah he, he got our CD, and he loved our music. He loved the band, and he was like, God, do you, he's all man, I got your CD, and I think it's excellent. Do you guys have any photos or, or you know, photos, band shots, or do you have any, um, a cover done for the album and stuff? And we said, yeah, and so we emailed it all to him. And, like, the, the pictures we had took, it was like, you know, there was shadow, it had the shadow effects, and we were, like, wearing dark stuff, you know, dark shirts and jeans, and and it was, you know, it, I guess it kind of looked like we were coming out of, you know, out of the shadows, kind of a sort of deal. And then our cover was real dark, it was a, it was a painting, you know, that, uh, of an abbey that was, you know, basically burnt down, and it was a very cool piece, but he hated it. He just hated it. He's like, you know, there's no statement on that. You guys look like a bunch of street kids. You guys got to get dressed up, you know, wear leather and have a background and stuff like that. And so basically the photos and the cover artwork you see there on the um, on uh, the self-titled disc, he was, uh, um, you know, basically, you know, saying if he agreed upon it, you know, if he liked it. You know, it's like we were doing like, okay, how you like these photos? Okay, I like those. How you like this cover? Oh, I like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. To what he was digging on and stuff. And we ended up not, you know, signing anything with him anyways in the end. And so we just released it. You know, we weren't even going to release the album. And then we got all this, all these people asking for the album and stuff. You know, the professional motion board, it was really lighting up on there. So we decided to press it. And you know, sold a lot of copies just by doing that. Well, Limp's, Work. Limp's more like true metal, isn't he? He does a lot of true metal stuff. What's that? Limp, he does a lot of true metal stuff. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Yeah, and, yeah, and I mean, he he's excellent. I mean, as far as, you know, he does great promotion, and he, he really does, uh, you know, good with the bands he has and stuff. It's just, you know, we, you know, obviously, uh, just, I guess, didn't fit in the fold at the end, or, you know, and, and we didn't, you know come to an agreement in the end so i don't know it's just one of those things you know right, okay next question Troy, is uh, how many demos did you do prior to the mini album um with eric actually we only did like um uh a two song demo which was actually we just did a uh, um uh jesus uh eyes of denial and voice of reason but they had different keyboard um parts to it that was the only difference really is that the keyboards like had different kind of tones and and uh just a different kind of feel to it and um mike connor had played on uh voice of reason and uh matt gillery played on uh eyes of denial but later on what we did is uh we decided hey w let's make you know let's make a full length cd and so we went in and uh, we put new keyboards because we wanted to go for more of an industrial kind of sound, more of a darker atmospheric sound on the keyboards. Mm -hmm. And so we hired, you know, the couple guys, and then we um, ended up just doing that. And we were, we had another song to go on that release as well, but we ran out of money before we had the chance to, you know, we we um, all we had left money-wise was just to mix the four songs. We hadn't put the vocals on this other song called Rebirth, which we'll probably re, you know, we'll release as a bonus track or something later on. Oh, good. But that was supposed to be on the first album as well, and I know a lot of people always say, oh, you know, how come the album's only 38 minutes and stuff? Well, you know, we were self-financing that, and, you know, we were paying, you know, pretty decent money by the hour and stuff, and it was, uh, it was expensive, and we just ran out of cash. It's just kind of where it came to. Why right, did it sell well? Yeah, it's so, uh, you know, actually we've, you know, sold over 2,000 copies on our own. I mean, it, we never put that on a label, and, you know, we're in the third pressing of the CDs, and, you know, it's selling really well. And, I mean, now that, you know, we have Towers out, it's, you know, it's already, you know, the buzz is coming back on on the first CD, and 
people are picking up the first CD again, so that's really cool. Is uh, Ken ever asked if he could re-release it for you for his label? Um, you know what? Uh, he he's never really brought it up. He, he did want to release it in the first place, you know, when we had uh, done it. But we were talking to other labels, and we, um, you know, we were kind of just you know playing the field at the time. We were just seeing like you know what would be the best for us to go out, and, you know, what company would be the best for us to work with. And after um, you know after we realized what company would work best, you know, then. Sensory became bigger. They got better distribution and, and stuff. And uh, Kim was always a straight shooter with us, and we really dug that. And so we gave him, you know, um, the first option to pick up, you know, the Towers of Avarice. I mean, we had not recorded the disc yet, and we said, you know, hey, man, you know, we're giving you first dibs on this thing. So if you want to sign us and re release uh, the Towers of Avarice, you're you're the first one up, but if you don't, then we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to shop it. Mm -hmm. And he had never heard any of the material on the disc. He just, you know, took took our word for it that it was going to be killer. And and uh, in the end, you know, we're all happy. So I mean, he was really stoked. You know, he was real scared at first because he was afraid it was going to. He's all, now this isn't going to blow, is it? And I'm all, no, no, man, it's going to be it's going to be better than the first disc. And he's all, okay, I'm I'm taking your word on it. And, and he was real happy with, you know, obviously how it turned out. So, yeah, I met Ken at uh, the first Power Mod Festival. Oh, right on. Which which one was that? It was the one with Vicious Rumors, Ed Land. Oh, right on. Yeah. Was, Those guys are from out here, man. Who was that? Vicious Rumors. Oh, They're they uh, real well. Yeah. I was, I was hanging out with them at Wacken a couple of weeks ago. Oh, right on. Yeah. Yeah. I when I was a little, when I was in high school, I was like a sophomore or something like that, and they came out with a. Uh, um, digital dictator or something like that and they were you know you know playing the stone in san francisco and i remember that place yeah we were too young to get in there and they wouldn't let us in and jeff thorpe was like you know he was walking into the door and i said hey jeff you know man we came out to see you but they're not letting us in because they're saying we're too young and you know they can't let us in because we're not you know 18 yet and this and that and he's all he's all oh man that's he's all that sucks he's all well let me let me see what i could do guys and then he came back and he brought the owner out, and the owner said, okay, you guys just can't, if I catch you drinking, your asses are out of here and stuff. And, you know, Jeff, he, he was a good guy. He got us into the show, man. We were well, really stoked. Him, man. You want to keep in touch? He's a nice guy. You want to keep in touch with him? Yeah, I haven't, you know, I haven't talked to him. I mean, I think that was the last time I ever talked to him. Then, you know, they got, you know, a little bigger and stuff, obviously, you know, signed to Atlantic and, you know. Never, never ha had the chance to talk to him again, never ran into him again. So. I've had a couple of mentions on their albums. What's that? I've had a couple of mentions on their albums. Did you really? The new one and uh, Cyber Christ. Nice, yeah. man. Look at you. <laughs> I've been around, man. I've, thanks for the mention, by the way. <laughs> I've been around on quite a lot of albums, man. I mean, I've been doing this fanzine now since 1988, so... Right on. Yeah, probably the longest lasting fanzine on the planet. That's great, man. <laughs> that is great, man. How many interviews have you done with English magazines, fanzines? Have you done anything? Or is this the first one? Um, you know, as far as the... English fanzines. I think this is the only one we've ever done. Good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've got the exclusive. Then. Yeah, there you go, man. I mean, we've done. Um, I, I, we've been on like some websites and stuff like yeah. that. Like, uh, um, God, what was the Rock Reunion? Is is that one? A, I don't know. I could be wrong. That might be a German one. I don't know. I, uh, but I, I thought it was out of the UK. I could right. be wrong though. But yeah, yeah, no doubt. And uh, we we gave you a thanks on uh, our album. Yeah, and no, I've got it, the new one. Yeah. Nice. See. One, yeah. See, you're all over the map, man. <laughs> God, like that. Everybody buys a record and thinks, "Fucking that guy's on it again." <laughs> just fuck off. <laughs> you see, getting your name out there, man. Nice. I mean, I know Paul from Slayer, the drummer, Paul Bostoff. Yeah. Back help. to the Forbidden days. Yeah, excellent drummer. Great. Yeah. And Forbidden was a killer band. Oh, uh, no, I've got a recording room for the sound desk from England. I'll have to copy it for you. Nice, yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of tapes I can do. I've got Crimson Glory from England in 88. Oh, my God. I've got that would be tape. awesome. I've got Sarcotic Walls from Rotterdam. Nice. You know what? I have, if you're a Forbidden fan, actually, I have their demos that they did um, after they uh, um, did, uh, wow, Jesus, Twisted Into Form. Yeah, I've got one of them. 
Yeah, see, yeah, and I, I got a, there's a bunch of songs that, like, didn't actually make distortion that were really cool. Yeah, I got the two-track two track demo that Craig gave me. He's got distortion and another song, but I can't remember what to call it. Was it, uh, um, God, what was the other song? Well, there was one, shit, uh, um, something of illusions, uh. Yeah, I can't remember, <laughs> Yeah, shit, I can't remember. I gotta pull it out, man. Fuck, it's been ages since I've listened to it. Alright, then, Trey, next question is, um, how do you best describe the band's music? Um, I would call it, I would just say, um, uh, heavy, dark, um, intricate, and dynamic. That's, that's how I would, uh. I mean, in the Best category describe of metal, it. how would you describe it? Progressive metal, atmospheric metal, scrap, um, scrap metal, whatever you want to call yeah. it. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess, you know, everybody's put the progressive metal label on it, yeah. so... Um, yeah, I guess, I guess progressive metal fits, you know, that, that will fit. You know, of course, I don't think any band really likes to be, you know, Time. under a specific thing or something like that, but, um... You know, I get progressive metal is the one that seems to fit us, you know, with fans and stuff. So, uh, you know, that works. You know, I just, I think a lot of times progressive metal is used kind of loosely because there's bands that they'll say, oh, yeah, this is a progressive metal band. And I'll be all like, well, they, they honest sound like, sound like just our, you know, like a, either a rock band to me or a metal band or, you know what I mean? It, yeah. it just, you know, the progressive thing has been used pretty loosely i think when progressive be started becoming you know a little bit popular after you know dream theater and fate's warning were really starting to make a move in there um a lot of bands were <laughs> a lot of labels were calling a lot of their bands progressive metal or something you know to right. sell the album so okay Troy. next question is, let's talk about the debut the very first debut why did you call it zero hour did you have any other titles no you know actually uh we just you know we we were lazy. We weren't <laughs> really thinking of uh, um, doing any, um, using any of the song names or anything. We just figured it'd be easy. Just you know, hey, let's leave it zero hour. That way, you know, on the cover, we don't have to write zero hour, the Towers of Avarice, or something like that. We'll just make it real simple. Sticker zero hour and a cover. Just leave it at that kind of thing. And the time. What's the, what's that? And the time as well. The time, you know, the the time that you have on the cover. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, next question is, was there any songs on that EP, mini album, whatever you want to call it, that you liked and disliked? Honestly, I am, you know, uh, I am happy with it. I mean, I am very, uh, I'm much more happy with uh, The Towers of Avarice. I mean, I love that. I think that's the true album of ours that, you know, the four of us really created that one. Um, but, uh... There's some great songs on the first one. Uh, I really like um, Awaken, because I think that song's really dark. That's part of Metamorphosis. Ascent is really good. That That's the last song on there, and that, you know, that kind of has a good dynamic, you know, flair to it. The System Remains is a very cool song, too. Um, Eyes of Denial is cool. I, you know, actually, I, you know, they're, they're all good songs, you know what I mean? Um, but definitely, I feel, uh, you know, I definitely like the material on Towers better. You know, that's more, you know, that that was more from the four of us, I would feel, yeah. Okay, our next question is, as we're talking about the new album, why did you call it the Towers of Avarice? Did you have, how do you compare it to the debut? Um, well, the reason why we call it the, the Towers of Avarice, that was just uh, actually the title that Eric had come up with, you know. He was, uh, we originally went in, um, you know, wanting to make a concept album. So, you know, we wrote all the music first and we laid it out for him. So, you know, the way we felt that it should be constructed, you know, the songs, the material. And then he uh, he came up with the idea. He's all, you know, I want to call it the Towers of Avarice. And, um, you know, I want to make it, you know, about this concept and da, da, da. And we're like, okay, cool, man. And that, you know, really Eric was the one who came up with, you know, all the lyrics and, you know, the titles and stuff, so, you know, he's the one to credit for that. Right, okay. So what is a, a Tower of Avarice? What is an Avarice? Avarice is extreme yeah. greed. That's so, what it sorry. means. What's that, man? What is it? Extreme greed. Right. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, it's, um, of course, Eric always says, I, you know, don't tell it quite right or something like that, but basically it's, you know, you know, you have this oppressor who, you know, basically, 
you know, all the people are the slaves, you know, his slaves to his trade and stuff, and, you know, he he just builds everything off them. He uses them to build his towers and, you know, become more powerful day by day. And then you have the subterranean who's the, you know, the hero of the, um, of the piece, and he's, he's the one who's been watching this all go down, and he wants to make a change. He wants to bring the towers down and bring uh, the oppressor down with the towers and, uh, you know, have the, have, uh, you know, their world start over, you know, even though he knows that it's going to kill, you know, many innocent people, but he feels that, you know, that it's getting out of control. And if he lets this guy go any further, you know, there won't ever be a chance for them to try and renew their lifestyles, you know? So that's pretty much, I guess, the basis of the, the concept there. All right. Okay. Next question is: Did you have any other titles for this album? No, actually, that was it. That was uh, honestly everything worked out pretty well. You know, I mean, we did write more music and stuff, but the music we always ended up scrapping it because we didn't feel it was up to par. You know, with with the other tunes that we were happy with. So um, there was a lot of uh, music that we scrapped, but. Um, as far as the lyrical ideas and the in the titles, um, everything you know really flowed for Eric. He said. Well, okay. What about the sales? Did it sell? Is it selling well at the moment? Um, I you know I hear from Ken it's selling consistently. He hasn't given me a number or anything yet, but um, um, he says he's happy that it's selling consistently. So, you know, ho- we're supposed to get a, you know, an idea of how many units sold here real soon. So. I guess I'll find out soon enough how we're doing, you know? Excellent, good. I was going to have Judas Priest on the cover. Yeah, I know, man. Gonna that's... Have, hopefully have Destruction in there. That's... Um, Jack Panzer. Nice. You guys. Um, Beyond Twilight, a band called Evergrey from Sweden. Yeah, they're um, a great band. I've got a, I've got a few bands in mind I'm trying to get a hold of. Nice. It's just going to take time, but my, my latest issue has got Rob Halford on the cover. Nice. Um, that's I'm great. <laughs> now, in this interview, you'll make me sound a... Uh, better than I really am, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I always, you know, because I always, you know, obviously on the phone you're always, you know, seeking out what the hell to say, you know, when uh, you do email stuff, you get time to think about it and email, but I like the, I like the phone interviews better anyways, because, you know, they're like more personal and there's stuff that comes out that you would not get out of a computer interview, you know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Yeah, like Christian, uh, Christian from uh, Edge of Time did a great interview with us. I know that was like a web scene, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And that was, uh, you know, he uh, he did a, you know, because he was down in uh, our area, California, for work from his, uh, you know, doing work for his job. And then we were talking to him, uh, you know, we just, he just hit the tape recorder and we just, you know, pretty much just chatted the whole night and he just took a bunch of stuff. It was great. You know? hmm. All right, Troy, my next question is, um, I believe at this album, also saw the band play at the Power Mad Festival. Is that correct? Um, we we played the Prague Power Festival oh, in yeah, Chicago. Oh, Power Mad then. Uh, no, Power Mad we won't be uh, playing at. Right, is it still going, you know? What's that? Is, is the Power Mad Festival still around? Because I used to know Kate, I stayed at his house when I was in Baltimore once. Yeah, it's still going on. I um, They're having one going on, uh, uh, yeah, I, they always have an... August. Shit, I guess it's happening this month coming up, huh? August, uh, or, or, shit, we're almost in September. Christ, I, I don't know if it's happened yet or not. I don't not. think it has because there's nothing on the internet. Yeah, I guess maybe they skipped it this year. I really don't know, to be honest with you. I know we there's were a real pl- cool festival in, the, in Michigan called the Metal Foundation. Oh, see, I've cool. never been to that one, yeah. It was the first one this year. Vicious Rumors played, Omen, Hellstar, Agent Steel. It was all like classic 80s power metal. Nice. So there's some new bands there, but... Now, you said you knew of uh, The Stone and all those places. Now, I, I take it you've been to America no, a few I times. I haven't, but I, I used to, on the, when I used to be a, like, in, like 15, 16, I used to buy a Metal Forces magazine. Nice! I always, I've got all of them, and he always used to say things about The Stone, all these bands like Testo and Exodus. Yeah! Oh, that was write, a great to, club. I used to write to a band called Hex. Yeah, oh yeah, they were from out here too, yeah. They were fucking great bands. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, a couple of bands from like some like the California area. Yeah, I mean we we had it really good at that time when in the late '80s we had a really good scene going on yeah, out here, and we had some great clubs. I mean, 
there was the Stone, the Omni, One Step Beyond, um, uh, Jesus, what was the other ones? Uh, yeah, well, you know, there, there was just great clubs out here. I mean, there was a lot, and now there's not jack shit out here, really, so it's kind of sad. The place we only play at is uh, this place called The Usual, which is really good to us, but all the, usually all the time when we play, it's not with, you know, metal acts. There's just not a lot of metal bands out here, which is unfortunate. Uh, do you get a good response? Yeah, we get good response when we play out here. You know, we got some great fans, and, um, you know, the people that come, you know, just happen to be at the show, you know, it, you know, either some are like, what the fuck is this? This is too long of songs or something, but or other people will be like, wow, man, that was just amazing stuff you guys did up there you know do you guys have an album and uh, i mean you know so we've had great response whenever we played out here it's been awesome so Excellent. so you're playing the power the prog power this year yeah we're gonna play uh prog power in europe that's we're looking really forward to that we've when never been to europe uh, when is what's it? that when is oh it's uh um god when is that it's in october the fifth october 5th we're playing i was thinking of coming over because i know the guy who runs it rennie yeah, man, you should come down, man. That would be birthday, great, man. We you know, get to hang out with you and stuff. It's my you know? birthday in October. It's 13th, 13th of October. That's why they call the fanzine Friday the 13th. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it's only, the only problem is that it's finding accommodation. Yeah, kind of, fifth and six, yeah. I believe it's the fifth and six, right? Right. Yeah, and we're playing the fifth. Right. So that's how it works. Good, yeah. I don't know. You should come to... down. How far are you from there? Uh, well, it's I'm a... in England. I live in the north of England. So I can get I can get a ship directly from my city right to Rotterdam. Nice. But the problem is, it's like finding somewhere to stay. I mean, I've just got back from Wacken Festival and I had like a thousand dollars in visa. So oh uh, shit! <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, no I doubt. mean, I'll, I'll prepared to come over if you can put me up in the hotel or something. That'd be great. You know, I might. Yeah, I you see. The thing is, I just don't know what the hell they're putting us up at. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if they're like squeezing the whole band into one room or what. You know what I mean? Because our manager's going with us too, and I, you know, I just we're going into it kind of blindly in some senses. You know, they say they got a room for us, but I, I just don't know how compact it's going to be and everything. You know? So how exciting are you for the? Oh, I'm I'm really excited. I've never been to Europe before, and you know we got some great fans out there that email us, and so I'm really excited to meet some of them, and um, you know to to see what the scene's like out there. You know, I have no idea. You know, yeah, it, right. I mean, I just know that there is a scene. There's definitely more of a scene out there than there is here. You know, I mean, so it'd be nice to see. Well, you probably do the festival, and you probably all like, relocate to Germany or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows, man? Who knows? So, why are you playing the Prog Power in America? You're not doing that one. This is one of the well, in LA, isn't something? We we did the Prog Power in Chicago, and then we didn't get asked to do the one that's going to happen in uh, New Orleans, I guess, uh, coming up. They didn't ask us because I guess you know since we were we played the one before and he wanted to get different bands so he can get you know tickets sold. But we are playing Ultrasound um, not this weekend but the weekend after, uh, which is at the Burbank Convention Center. But uh, I know that they've had a lot of bands bail out. The Flotsam and Jetsam was supposed to play, and, oh, yeah. you know, and they bailed out. So I, you know, hopefully the event's still pretty good. We'll see how that's going to be. Who's playing this one. You know, <clears throat> it's really no known bands. I mean, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, Jakey Lee's new band's playing. Um, the singer of TNT, his new band's playing. No, Westworld. Yeah, they're playing. I, I, but, you know, besides that, a lot of those bands that are on the bill, I really have not heard of. Agent Steel is playing. But I'm they're... going to change the name. Yeah, I thought they were going to change the name too, but I guess they worked everything out to where they get to keep the name. But why should they change the name? I mean, everybody knows Agent Steel. I mean, I know Bernie, the guitarist. Yeah. I was hanging out with a handbag with him last year. We ended up going to uh, look around some uh, strip bars and shit. Oh, nice! <laughs> you can't go wrong. <laughs> can't well, go wrong. What a sad project, Engine, with Ray Alder was playing. Yeah. Nice. I, I ended yeah. up buying, like, Ray was, ended up buying me drinks. He's, like, such a cool guy. He's, like, an amazing singer. Excellent. That is very cool. Like, Fate's one of my favorite progressive bands. I was just like hanging out with the singer. That's really awesome, great. man. That's awesome. That is awesome. Looks like, man, you've gotten a chance to hang out with a lot of people, man. Metallica, That's cool. I interviewed Metallica, uh, fucking, uh, Pantera, Slayer. Nice. <laughs> Shit, yeah, dude. That's yeah, pretty cool. All right, then. 
Um, sorry, your next question is, um, how did you hook up with Ken at Laser's Edge, and what other labels showed interest? Um, well, when we, we had talked to him on the first CD, and he was interested in putting out the first CD. Right. However, uh, um, you know, like I said, we were playing the field on that one, so we were talking to a lot of labels at the time, and we just never came to an agreement with any of these uh, these labels. And so when it came down, we were, like, writing material to the next album already, and we were ready to go in and record it. And uh, he was the... You know, he was the one who was straight with us from the from the get go. I mean, he, we had a comfortable relationship talking to him on the phone, um, discussing things. And uh, his label had gotten bigger at this time when we were, uh, you know, after you know a year or two of you know um, knowing him. And uh, then that's when we decided to give him first crack at the album. You know, we said, "Hey, man, you know, we're we're planning on doing this album, and you know, we're, we we want to give you a." Uh, first crack at it and uh if you want it cool if not then we're gonna you know demo it and we're gonna start shopping it but at that particular time we had not put anything on recorded anything for the new album you know for towers at the time so he was just going on our word and he was you know so cool enough to to take our word for it and he told us he was interested and sent us a contract and whatever changes we wanted were made you know, I mean, we weren't asking for much, but we had our you know, manager discuss it with him, and Ken made him, and he was, you know, just straight shooter from the get-go. So that we liked the way he conducted business, so that's why we worked with him. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. So what other labels showed interest? Did anybody like Inside Out Records? Cause they're like Inside Out was actually sent us three different contracts. Yeah, the label that sent you three. <laughs> yeah, they were the ones who sent us three different contracts. We received a contract from Lim Schnorr, Right. Um, never, you know, came to an agreement um, on that. And actually, that was, you know, not even a, uh, you know, it was like, you know, basically uh, a draft of a contract. I mean, there was, that particular one didn't have like zero hour on it or anything, but just, you know, basically just to, something for us to work with. And also, uh, there was, um, Chris from Flying Dolphin had contacted oh, us. Um, Grave Digger Singer. Yeah, exactly. I saw yeah. Grave Digger at Wacken three weeks ago. They were a good band, Lars. Yeah, yeah. I and I, I guess what happened with him is he uh, he had like sent it to Blackmark Records and Blackmark. Well, they suck. Oof. Yeah, and that's <laughs> what that's what uh um because we were talking to Lim at the time and Lim was like, oh, that's a shitty label, you know, don't go with those guys. And well, I had some friends on that label, a band called Tad Moroz. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, and uh, I know uh, one of the guys out here who. Uh, helps them out and he was telling me that yeah they were very unhappy with that really label that black mark. so that was one and then leviathan showed interest and um just in. yeah he showed interest um let me think there was a label called metal age that's in germany that showed that. interest supposedly frontiers in the uk oh, yeah. there was like you know because when i talked to uh um oh god i I can't believe I can't think of his name right now. The guy from uh, oh, now and then. Know, Hard Rocks magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Shit. Another guy, another guy from Now and Then Records, Mark Ashley. Okay, yeah, see, well, anyways, the guy from Hard Rocks magazine had said that uh, he had, like, mentioned to them that they, uh, you know, Zero Hour was looking for a label. So and that they the label. Yeah, and that's probably... <laughs> That's probably why we never, ever, uh, re you know, received an email back from them, because he's like, you know, contact this guy. He said that he might be interested in putting it out. So that one was, was really flat. That one really didn't do anything. What about you know? Century Media and people like Metal Blur? Any of them? No, um, no, you know, uh, we never got to shop towers, obviously, but we did send, um, um, you know, the first CD, the self-titled CD, yeah. And Metal Blade was not interested. Um, Massacre was really cool. They ended up passing on it at the end, but they were they were really considering it. But um, they ended up uh, saying that they felt that it wasn't um, they felt that it wasn't um, commercial enough. Like it didn't have enough hooks. Our self titled disc. But then they really wanted to license it from um, Towers of Avarice from Ken. Right. They were really interested, and so was Rising Sun. Rising Sun wanted to <laughs> license Towers of... It, it was unreal, because when the Towers of Avarice hit, 
a lot of the labels that had passed on us before, they were interested in licensing licensing it out in Europe for Ken from right. Ken. So, so that was really good. So we never had a chance to obviously shop like the Towers of Avarice to Century Media or Nuclear Blast or anything like that. So, right. but uh, Century Media seems to be the you know the big one right now. You know, as far as uh, for the metal bands, that one's a great label. Right, okay, next question, Troy, is, so you hooked up with uh, Travis Smith for the artwork. Yeah. I mean, how did you hook up with him? What? You know, that was Ken Golden. I mean, Ken, you know, he had, we had uh, checked out a couple other guys that he had worked with or, or was thinking of working with, and we never came up to, a, you know, agreement with any of the guys that um, either, like, a, a painting we might have thought was cool, you know, Ken didn't think was all that great, and so then he was like, well, you know, I've always been wanting to try Travis Smith out. We're like, Travis Smith, where have I heard that? And then Chocolate he said, he, and death, he? Yeah, exactly. And then when he said that, and we're like, oh, yeah, no, that's the guy, man. That guy's awesome. We would love to work with him. And Is so he expensive? said, well, you know what? I have no idea how much right. it cost it because uh, Ken covered that right. part of it. So um, I really don't know. But, um, I mean, you know, he, he was awesome. Travis did an amazing job on our CD. When I got the CD, finally saw the CD for the first time, got it in the mail, I just stared at it for like, you know, a half hour. <laughs> and I was like, well, shit, maybe I should put this thing in the fucking CD player and listen to it, huh? You know what I mean? It was, I was that blown away by the artwork. I mean, he did an amazing job. Right, did you have any of the covers in mind for this album? Did we have what, Sam? Any, any of the covers, artwork, for this album? Mm, do I have any of the covers? Uh, did you have any of the covers for this album? When, when, when Travis Smith was doing the artwork, did you have any of the covers in mind? That you oh, okay, I, I got gotcha. you. Um, no, um, you know, there was there was this guy, Peter Grick, that uh, um, we had checked out his stuff, and there was this one painting that was pretty cool. I can't remember what it was, and I think it had, it, you know, it had a picture of a tower and stuff. And we were kind of interested in using that, but no, um, you know, that was pretty much it. I mean, when Travis started doing the stuff, you know, we kind of like uh, gave him a little idea of what we were looking for, and he really ran with it and went even further and just made these great pieces, and he sent them to us, and we're like, yeah, this is killer. That would be, we would feel that would be good for the disc tray, or this would be good for the back, and I mean, the guy just did amazing Amazing work. I mean, when you got that guy, shit, you don't need anybody else. The guy's amazing. I mean, how much artwork did he do for the album? Because I know he's done like he did like twenty-five different artworks for Nevermore before they actually decided which they wanted. Yeah, exactly. You know, I I had heard that too. He he was telling me that, but um, for us, you know, he came up with the pieces. Um, there wasn't a piece we turned away. Every piece that he came up with, um, we were we were like, yeah, that's that works for this spot or this works for the cover or whatever and uh he pretty much had it laid out the same way anyway so um there was no extra pieces out there that he had uh the only other thing actually there was just he did take our photo and he did like kind of a, a kind of a negative uh to it like a you know how you have a positive negative kind of look to a, a camera shot or something yeah he kind of did a, a more of a negative look to our photo, which looked really cool. But we were we were like, well, we honestly like just uh, the picture how it is itself. Just you know, keep it like the way it is, and that was it. You know what I mean? But everything else, uh, you know, that's all he brought. You know, that's what he brought to us, and and we dug it all. So I don't think there was the only thing that we ever uh, had a little trouble with is like. Just one. T he brought the first thing he sent. He's like, "Well, this." He's all, "What do you think of this uh, um, logo for the band?" And we weren't crazy about it. And he's like, "Yeah, I wasn't crazy about it either and stuff." And then he, you know, came back with the other thing. And then we're like, "Okay, that's perfect." So and he's like, "You guys are too easy." So I mean, I think we were real easy to work with in comparison to some of the other ones because I'm sure he gets bigger budgets, you know, from. Uh, you know other labels and he goes off on all kinds of different ideas where this one he probably didn't get as big of a budget to work with so right, okay next question yeah. Troy is um, I, may, I may be wrong in saying this but wasn't Neil Caron going to work with the band at one point 
No, actually, uh, we never talked to, uh, I, I've never talked to Neil Caron. You know, we always um, wanted to just use Dino because we love Dino's production. I mean, he's definitely the producer for us. How so. did you hook up with him anyway? Um, a long time ago when we were uh, doing actually a, uh, our earlier demo um, at Prairie Sun, um, he was, uh, you know, we were calling to get... Uh, you know, a guy uh, to to do the job of you know the you know engineer duties and stuff, and they had mentioned you know Dino you know they mentioned a couple people were like nah nah and he's all how about Dino Alden? I'm all Dino Alden. Where have I heard that name? Who's he he's works all, with? Because I've heard the name before. Yeah, he did. Uh, he did Marty Freeman's Dragon's Kiss. Right. And he did a lot of. Uh, he was like the second engineer on a lot of Shrapnel albums, like oh, right. so his friends the Racer X. The the vicious, like, well, you know, like the Vicious Rumors album, um, uh, Digital Dictator, he recorded, like, the bass tracks and, and stuff like that, and he's the one who actually played the piano piece at the end of that album. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, how they have all that reverse, like, you know, I just look like that kind of thing over the piano piece. I guess they were saying, like, all positive messages, like, stay in school and all this stuff, so it's kind of funny, you know, where people would probably think, oh, man, they're Probably seen some well, I remember you. that because I played it backwards once, and I think it said if you play this record backwards, it will fuck your needle. Yeah, well, maybe that was it too. I I don't know. Was it was, it? I think that was it, wasn't it? Yeah, it's probably that exactly. And he was the one who played the piano piece in, on that. And he's, I mean, he's just been all over the map as a second engineer, like you know, on the Racer X albums, Cacophony albums. So, and he did uh, actually the first couple of Magica albums. I know that they've started. You know, they got an album out on Which Massacre band? out there. And then, uh... Which band was that, Troy? A Magica? Oh, right. That's the band Massacre. Yeah, they... Holy Trinity or something, what they call the album. Trinity yeah, they didn't, do, they didn't do the last one. He didn't do the last one with them, but he did their first couple ones that they had put out on smaller labels. And, uh... And then, uh... Who else did he work with? Yeah, and, and he did the Mordred albums. He did two of the Mordred albums. Right back in the day so yeah he's you know he's been here and there in the scene and stuff and I mean he's an excellent producer he's great yeah he sounds good nice drum yeah sound, oh yeah he's amazing he's, he truly is amazing at his art alright okay next question is are you happy with any results for this album yes definitely I mean I, I look the, the sound the look the tunes the material everything I mean you know it's just I'm very very pleased. The whole band is very pleased with the outcome of this album. Brilliant. Okay, next question is, um, basically, could you just tell me briefly what the songs are about on this album? Do you know? Or is that something your singer's going to have to enlighten me with? <laughs> yeah, the singer, you know what, I should have, uh, um, you know, the singer email you. Yeah, like, please, yeah. That'd yeah, be that would be the best thing, because uh, that way I don't get, uh, yeah, because he, he would be able to better answer that part of it than me. Okay, fair enough. Next question is, um, how do you compare this album to the previous album? Definitely, these ones are heavier, for sure. Um, I feel they're, you know, uh, more dynamic, more tense, you know, more intense. Of uh, You know, a lot of people always describe this album as a very cold album. And uh, it's true, because, I mean, we were, we were pretty in, uh, we were in, uh, the band was in a pretty dark place at the time because we were just going through all these, you know, contract negotiations, and we were just frustrated as all hell that things weren't panning out for us on on uh, shopping the self-titled CD, and this was just pouring out of us into our music. So um, definitely, you know, uh, a much more mature band, you know, heavier, you know, more of what Zero Hour um, is all about. Right. Okay, so what songs on the new album do you like and dislike? Is there any ones that you, you found particularly interesting? Or my like? favorites, my favorites uh, would I like all the songs. Um, my favorites, I would have to say, I love Demise and Vestige. That's a great song. Why do you like that one the most? That one pretty much sums up Zero Hour altogether because it's you know it's a 15 minute long song and it go it takes you through all these twists and turns. But you know I feel is you know, melodic though. It never like you know. I mean, it's real dynamic song, very intricate, but goes through a lot of nice clean passages, and, and it goes through some great heavy passages. 
and always keeps that um, cold intensity to the to the song. It never like loses that you know tension, and that's one of the reasons why I I, I love that song so much. And um, um, stratagem, you know, I love that song. You know, I get to play you know crazy bass lines all over that thing. So <laughs> you know, that's one of the reasons why I really love that song. That song, whenever I play that long live, that's that song's never boring to me. It's a lot of fun to play. Right, okay. Next question is, um, what bands have you played with so far in your career? Have you played with anybody else? Is this going to be like the first time playing the prog power that you're going to be a chance to play with anybody? Um, let's see. Uh, when we do pro, well, we're going to play a, um, um, the Zero Thirteen Club in uh, the Netherlands. That with, sounds like an interesting name, considering the band Zero Hour. <laughs> oh, what's that? So it sounds like a very interesting name for a club. Yeah, I know. How huh? about that? Yeah, man. I mean, it's supposed to be a beautiful venue. I mean, it's, it's Where in Holland to be... is it? Where is it in Holland? It's uh, in um, uh, Holland. It's it's in Holland in the Netherlands. Yeah, well, and whereabouts? Whereabouts in Holland? Ah, uh, you what's see, I, you know, I really don't know. I'm Not so... Amsterdam or anywhere like that? Mm, he shoot. I, I don't know. I have to check that up. Actually, they uh, on our website, it has a um, on there. It says upcoming shows, and we have the website to that place up there. I was looking at your website yesterday at college. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah. and and we uh, have a uh, um, we're playing with uh, Maya Dome and Sun Cage. Oh, Maya Dome. Yeah. Hey, so nice to say hello to Teddy for me. I will, man. He's a great guy, man. I like Teddy. Some case, yeah. that's uh, ex Lima voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've been so trying to get in touch with those guys because I want to wear the CD. Yeah. Just give we're, them my we're... address, man. If you, if you, you know. Just yeah, I will. Stuff. I will definitely. Good luck. Man. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. Okay. Right then. So next question is: um, Does any of the band members have any side projects? And what style of music do they play? Mm, um. <sighs> Not really. Uh, uh, Eric's been like in this prog rocky kind of band. Um, I don't know the name of it or anything. To be honest with you, he's he's been doing that. Um, I know that they've been trying to complete an album. I don't know if they've completed it yet. To be honest with you, but he's got that sort of thing. And um, then uh, actually, Jason, Mikey, and I have a side band. Um, that uh but we don't have a name for it and it's it's kind of it's definitely uh heavier style in the mashuga realm right. kind of that's that side of things so and we got a you know a growling singer and stuff and it's very cool stuff hasn't your brother done a solo album instrumental or something that's right jay did a <laughs> forgot all about that he's got a um he's got nice pulse which is like a new age you know kind of you know very little like jazz but more new age kind of like uh, best described like Marty Friedman's scenes, right? And uh, very mellow, and I mean, great material. You know, I so play. I like to listen to it, actually. It oh, good. you don't have a copy of that. Not yet. I'll have to send a copy of that to you, man. I tell you what, Troy. I'm gonna t I'm gonna send you three CDs. I'm gonna tape you Forbidden for the Sound Desk. Nice. I'm gonna do your Sacred It Walls and Crimson Glory. Excellent. In return, man. can you send us a Zero Hour T-shirt if you've got any? Appreciate yeah, that. I could do that, man. You you just uh, send me your address, man, and uh, um, by email, and I will send those bad boys to you, man. Yeah, cheers, brother. Okay, then, Trey. Before we finish this interview, I'd like to thank you for your time. Dude, Wish hey, you thank you. All the you. best at Prog Power. If I see you there, then we'll have a beer. If not, then absolutely. Do you have anything to say <laughs> to the fans and readers? Um, just you know, thank you for all of your support, and you know, thank you, man, for you know helping us spread the word. I mean, yeah, no you know, we really appreciate it because. Uh, you know, it's a tough business, and especially for prog metal. I mean, it's a small market, and we can use all the help we can get, and I really appreciate the interview. And, and, and hey, thank you so much again, man, for taking the time out to interview me, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for the interview. I appreciate it. Right on, man. Keep in touch, and uh, good luck with the tour. All right. Thanks, bro. Hopefully we'll see you. I'll probably send you an email tomorrow or something. Sounds good, Jeez, man. Please, Troy. Take care and say hello to the guys for me. I will, bro. See you later. Brother. Later. Bye. Bye.